Hello everyone, I'm Johnny Christ and you're listening to Drinks with Johnny. Today I'm joined by John DeMayan of System of a Down and Scars on Broadway. We share some tour secrets, talk about his love for comic books, and drink some scotch. So kick off your shoes, or don't, and enjoy this edition of the Drinks with Johnny podcast. Let's get this thing started and have some fun. All right, let's do it. I heard you're a scotch man. This happens to be your bottle, but you know, in the interest of showing a couple things, I'm going to sure. go through a couple different let's bottles. This one. Let's grab this one. This one is uh, a Highland, so Highland I'm going to go neat with. And uh, I'm going to show the kids at home a little poor. You know, the kids need to know. Yes, the kids. So a lot of times, you know, you can do your shots or whatever, but if you've ever heard the term, a finger or two. So this is going to be a two finger pour. We're going to take two fingers and we're going to pour it right up to that. Some people's uh, fingers are bigger than others, but and, it's just genetics. Yeah. Well, good thing that I push them right up and against it and get it nice and fat so you get a nice pour. You get that warmth too from your fingers. I do. Smooth. I like it. You want to try any of these? Yeah, I'll give it a shot. Yeah. So it's just a Highland that I that I got. Yeah, you're right. This does smell smooth. Yeah. It's, a, it's gonna be a lot smoother than uh, the next one we're about to drink. That one's comparable to a, to a Macallan, I think. Yeah, I would agree. And then the next one is gonna be my kind of favorites. It's Ardbeg, it's from uh, the island of Isla, and the region, rather, of Isla. And that's where you're gonna get most of your peatier scotches, and you know, kind of, a lot of people say it tastes like a tar pit or something like that. I absolutely I think, love did it. Did the cork get stuck? It did. Holy shit. Fix that real <laughs> now quick. it's really gonna be too mossy. <laughs> <laughs> Corky slash beer. Now it now it's see that's the perfect way to pour here at Drinks with Johnny. We're gonna do another two finger pour. And with this, I like to take a little eyedropper, put in a, just a couple couple little drops, and that's just gonna cut it just a tinge, and open up a lot of those peaty flavors that are that are you know predominant from Isla. Yeah, and right away, I mean, it's very strong aroma. You can smell the uh, the peat moss, a little bit of cork. <laughs> <laughs> that couldn't have been more perfect, by the way. <laughs> All right. I know I'm not going to like this because I don't generally like peat mossy, but let's try it anyway. <laughs> Smooth. <laughs> yeah, perfect. it's more of a, well, obviously peat mossy, but it's a smoky flavor. It's got a little bit of bitterness to it. Still, really good whiskey. Not my my, my favorite, but uh, but you know, for a peat mossy, it's really good. Yeah, that's, that's one that's one of my favorite bottles, to be honest. I'll try one more sip of this. Yeah, yeah. Take as much as you want while you move on to the way that we spoke before. Very good. The way that you like it is a little Johnny Walker mm -hmm. with some ice. So I didn't open this one yet before you got here purposely. I well, you know, to, uh, sometimes you go to a strip club, which you've probably been to once or I've twice. I've never been to a strip club, of course John. Not. Come on. But in the old days when we were single <laughs> and we'd go to strip clubs, you had to be very careful because uh, whenever they heard somebody was buying an expensive bottle of anything, you had to make sure that they brought the bottle to your table and that you opened it yourself. Otherwise, you'd be drinking black label out of a blue label. That sounds if about you're right. lucky. If you're lucky, it would be black label. If you were lucky. Blue label. So I got you a little fancy glass. Beautiful. A little fancy ice for you. And yeah. then, uh, as this, discussed, we, you didn't get the Death Star one? I, you know, I couldn't. You couldn't I find tried, it? I, I tried to etch it in myself, but I, I'm just not <laughs> it that kind of looks. Artist. I got to be honest with you, it looks exactly <laughs> like the one I bought. Yeah. Except mine, the outer, the, the outer shell of what you're pouring the water into looks exactly like the Death Star. That's pretty And the sick. inside does not. But okay. it looks very similar to that. It's close. That's what we're yeah. going to go with. I'm not going to bother with the fingers on this one. Yeah, traditionally, we we're don't use this fun. much ice. No. But what's great about ice like that, first of all, it doesn't melt right away. Yeah. So it's not going to water down your drink. You want to sip first? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. For tradition. It's good stuff, right? That's fucking excellent. Yeah, Johnny Blue has been a favorite of mine for many years. So tell me a little bit about what turned you on to Johnny Blue. Why is it's it your, one of your favorites for a lot of years? Just because well, it's good? Or? <laughs> it's, it's, it's really good. It's easy to find. You can find it pretty much anywhere in the world. And I started, I, I, originally whiskey tasted horrible to me, which I think is the case for most alcohol, right? Like you kind of develop yeah. a taste for it. And um, I started with really Jack and Coke. That was my introduction to... Um, you know, drinking brand, there, yeah, not yeah. brandy, but what, what is it? 
American, uh, whiskey. Whiskey. It's, it's American whiskey. It's American whiskey. It's a Kentucky bourbon. Bourbon, yeah. That's what I searching for that word. It could have been three, <laughs> three more hours. It's a Tennessee bourbon, actually. Tennessee. There you go. Yeah. So anyway, started with the bourbon, but mixed it with Coke. And then, I don't know, I just developed a flavor for it, enjoyed it more, and then used less and less Coke. And then I was like, okay, well, you know, Jack's great, but let me see what else there is and explored. Fell in love with Black Label for a while. We used to... Um, we used to drink a lot more when we were playing less uh, time on stage. <laughs> so I'd have like a... Yeah, I understand that. And it kind of started with, uh, you know, when you're single, you're, you're going out, you're enjoying yourself, and you're, generally speaking, more often than not, you're drinking. And uh, yeah, Black Devil was perfect. We had it at every show. We drink probably like a half a bottle on stage. We could get it, like you said, not just every show like in the States. It's kind of worldwide. You could get Black Label. Pretty yeah, much and anywhere. it's interesting because if you go different places, for example, like uh, South America, it's all about Red Label. Yeah. Right? And some parts of Europe as well, especially Spain. Yeah. So you go there and all they have in every bar is Red Label. They actually charge more for Red Label than Black Label. Which is funny because it's, as we, as we know from drinking a lot of yes. scotch, it's actually the other way around. It yeah, should be because yeah. it take, you know, they're producing red label very quickly. Whereas with black label, green label, blue label, etc., it's taking longer to distill. They're, they're putting it in different casks. It costs more to produce. Absolutely. It's better ingredients. So you'd expect it to be more expensive. And that, you know, for whatever reason, hey, if they, if they want it, and they want to pay more for it, that's their business. That, that, that's the supply and demand, right? But you, be, you, know, you, you sit there, you're flabbergasted because like, why would you be drinking Red Label? Sense. You have a Black Label bottle on the shelf below it. And it's less. <laughs> Makes no sense. <laughs> well, I'm going to go ahead and pour myself. Those are nice cubes. A little though. bit. Yeah, thank you, man. These are going to be the ones we're going to go for later. I just wanted to make something look a little bit No, nice that's very way. nice. I like the, death, the whole Star Wars theme. <laughs> yeah, the Star Wars theme. We're just going to pretend that's the Death Star. In there. It is. It is. We'll, just, yeah, is we'll, we'll change it in post. And by worry. the way, this is the proper way to destroy a Death Star. With scotch. That's right. That bullshit they did in the movies? No, no. Forget about it. Cheers, brother. Cheers. Cheers to all of you who are, of course, 21 and over. And on that note, I want to mention something else. It's October. Fall is here. Halloween is around the corner. It's my favorite time of year, and I'm in a good mood. So from now till November 1st, I'm giving you free shipping on all your Drinks With Johnny merch purchases. That's right. Head over to drinkswithjohnny.com and use promo code CHEERS to receive free shipping on all orders placed through Halloween. That's Drinks With Johnny at D-R-I-N-K-S-W-I-T-H-J-O-H-N-N-Y.com. Promo code C-H-E-E-R-S to receive free shipping on all your orders. The holidays are just around the corner and they always seem to come up faster than you realize it. So get ahead of them and head over to drinkswithjohnny.com and get your orders in now. Cheers. All right, John, I got you on the couch. You ready for this? Yeah, I'm ready, but uh, what the fuck is this? I'm glad you asked, John. It's Johnny Jenga. <laughs> We're putting money on this for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So. The game of Johnny Jenga is a normal game of Jenga. You pull your, uh, your block, you gotta put it on a complete set on the top here. If you pull a block that has something written on it, you gotta read it out loud, do the action. You might have a penalty of drinking some more, taking another block, something along those lines. Now we'll do a game of, let's call it best out of five. Okay. I like what you said. All right. Let's do a game of best out of five. And let's do it for, since we're at five, about 500? Sounds good. Okay. We got a game, $500, best of five, let's go. Let's do it. Home team goes first. Home team goes first, all right, man. So while we're doing this, I just wanted to have a quick chat. Ooh, these are tighter than I expected. Yeah, that's, that's what, what she, she said. said. Ah. All right. So, I know you are born in Lebanon. Yes. Beirut, um, when did you move into the States? Um, actually, it's a little more convoluted than that. Okay. First, there was the uh, Civil War in Lebanon in the early 70s. Okay. So pretty much everywhere was a battleground every day. Um, we took asylum out of Cyprus. So first we went to Cyprus, and then we took asylum. Some of my family got asylum in the United States, some got it in Europe. We got it in Canada. Okay. So we went to Canada, lived there for about four years, and then moved to Southern California. Okay, and when did you get into Southern California then? That Must was... have been like 1980. 1980, and you 80 came as a, as a family, obviously. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, okay. I was like seven or eight years old. Seven or eight years old, okay. Um, I was thinking about moving out on my own, but not quite then. <laughs> I'm sure you probably could have. So, uh, 
All right. We know. What do we got here? Oh, you got something. Let's see what it is. Everybody drinks. Fuck. That's an easy one. Cheers. So, uh, at that age, were you already in love with music when you were coming over to the States? Did you have any influences before? You said you were about seven, year, seven or eight years yeah, old. Yeah, yeah. So my dad was a musician, and he, coincidentally, he started on drums. Um, okay. So back then, they were basically like funeral marches, right? So they would have a band and do like a funeral dirge or something like that. Wow. And he, was the, he, was, he played the bass drum and the snare. Okay. And then he eventually started to play clarinet. He fell in love with jazz music. He actually got a scholarship to a Berklee School of Music. Oh, right on. And then my grandfather tempted him with an Alfa Romeo to stay in Lebanon instead of going to Berkeley. Uh, he didn't want to, okay. be, you know, he didn't want a son leaving, um, which worked out for me because otherwise I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be here. You know. Yeah. But then he started playing a saxophone around like the age of 16 or 17, and then that was it. He just played saxophone. So your dad started on the drums and then went into clarinet and saxophone. Yeah. Did, did you start on drums or did you uh, have a, you know, a horn instrument before that, and then you moved into drums? Or what, how was that transition for you? For me, it was always drums. Always drums, gotcha. So at the age of two, my dad would put on uh, like eight tracks and I would just drum along to it. And then whenever he'd have a performance, I'd be on stage, on the side of the stage, doing the same thing. Just mimicking the movement of drumming. That. You know? At two years old, so it was just at like- two years it was, old. It was just yeah. in your blood. Yeah, I'm clean again, I'm clean, I'm clean. You're clean. No? Well, I mean, in this game. We'll drink anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Cheers, man. So I've always been a fan of your drumming in, in the, the biggest sense is how you kind of orchestrate your, your, uh, your playing. It's not just, you know, here's the beat, here's the song. It's, you know, when I put in a fill, you better damn well know it's coming and, mm -hmm. it, and, it's, and, it's got, and it's serving its purpose. Was there anyone that influenced you along the way that taught you that? Or was that kind of something that you just, like, when you play the drums, you just felt... Like, I'm gonna do a fill, it's gonna mean something. Oh, I didn't even look at the bottom there. Oh, 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 still. Take three drinks. <laughs> yeah, take three drinks, man. Well, I take three drinks. <laughs> 500 bucks on the line, you gotta take three drinks. I'll take three drinks. Okay, what was at the question again, bro? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the question was, um, uh, now I don't even remember what it was. Anybody in the room remember? You remember? You asked about, you were talking about fills. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 so yeah. my so influences. Yeah, so your influences yeah. on just the way that you orchestrate and when you go for a fill and, and it fits perfectly in the songs, especially uh, uh, albums like Toxicity when it, like no one else was really hearing drummers come in like with those kind of fills that were like kind of funky in, the, in that like kind of pop hardcore realm, right? And, uh, but super tasty. So was there someone in a different genre that was inspiring you or something like that? I definitely listened to a lot of different kinds of music. You know, my dad had a, a jazz record collection. My cousin introduced me to a lot of the rock bands that influenced me. Um, absolutely, Keith Moon was my number one influence drum-wise. Okay, awesome. As far as rock. Yeah. For jazz, there's a, a trumpet player called Maynard Ferguson. Okay. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Uh, you know I probably have one of those records over there. But... Possibly. <laughs> well, he had an album called uh, Carnival. Okay. And my dad's, you know, copy. And the back of that album was scratched off, so I never knew the drummers. I found out years later, but I've since then forgotten it. a lot of whiskey. It's your turn, by the way. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I found a loose one, John. I found a loose one. Yeah, that's what we attempt to do. <laughs> We're still talking Jenga, though, right? Mm -hmm. So along the, along the way, when I finally convinced my parents to, to get me a drum set, I was 15. Okay. So they, they bought me this drum set, and I just would practice six, seven hours a day. Uh, I would leave school early to uh, practice. I think that's kind of like... That's a similar story I feel like with a lot of musicians that have become successful. They've uh, put pretty much all their hour and hours and effort at, at a young age into that craft. And you know, it's just... Well, if, you, if you're gonna be successful at anything, you have to put everything into it. Mm -hmm. The only problem is for us, any, any, kind of art, any kind of art form, not just being a musician, but I mean, there's no guarantee of any kind of success. There's no guarantee of any kind of living. You can't really uh, depend on having a family or anything else. So you put all this effort into it, you put all your passion into it, you, you put in the man hours to learn the craft, and then you can end up making no money off it. Yeah, we gotta, I mean, for me, it was, it was always go for broke. Like, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, if yeah. you put it all, if you, look, not you have Not saying that that works out every time. The salmon that puts in the most effort spawns yeah. the next generation. Mm -hmm. You know, so ultimately, a lot of the salmon going up that river 
you know, that waterfall to, to the spawning grounds die along the way, you know, and most of them won't make it, exhaustion, exhaustion or predators or just, you know, they don't live that long. Mm -hmm. But the ones that make it spawn the next generation. So let me set it best. Somebody's got to make it. It's true. Right? Yeah. Somebody's got to make it. Somebody's got to be the next NFL player. Somebody's got to be the next uh, musician. Somebody's got to be the next actor. Whatever the art is, the sculptor, whatever it is. If you, if you put everything into it, and if you fail, first of all, you may not fail to the level that you think you'll fail at. Right? Yeah. If you've put everything into it, you're, you'll get to some level of success somewhere in your life. But if you put in what I like to call kind of a half-assed mindset, where you're like, well, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do this. And I'm not going to ever put all my effort into this because if I do and I fail, then I'm a failure. It's, it's a complete opposite. Yeah. If you put all your effort into something truly, right, and you may not have the talent to succeed. You may not have the drive. You may not have the luck, right? All of these things have to go right for you to succeed. And if it doesn't happen for you, you're not a failure. But at the end of the day, you you will die a happy person because you'll know that you didn't you fail you because you just barely gave it your no. effort. Yeah. You, you put you everything really into it up. and you didn't make it to where you wanted to aspire to, but you made it a level lower or two levels lower, or maybe you failed absolutely. Again, if you don't put in that effort, don't step you up have to no play, chance, you, you yeah. have no chance of succeeding if you don't put in the it's effort. It's like baseball, don't step up to the plate, you don't know if you get hit or run. And again, somebody's going to do it. Someone's going to do it. So why not you? Someone's going to take the next Jenga block. It's going to be you. Oh, John, that was getting close. Listen, I've never gotten anywhere <laughs> without taking chances. <laughs> it's the same, man. You know, you know what it is, bro. Like, you guys, you guys did it the same way. You busted your ass. You played a lot of shows. You probably cost yourself a ton of money before you got signed. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, yeah, and being, being a drummer is no picnic. Not even cost yourself a lot of money. Before, it's, it's, it's really about... Being in one of those Econo vans, going across the country at like 18, 19 years old, and you're on top ramen and going through McDonald's because they got a value meal. Because that's what you're going to afford to eat. And that's going to be the only thing you're going to eat. See, so you, were, you were a little younger. I was 25 when we got signed. And uh, let me tell you, it's no picnic at 25 telling your parents, oh, you yeah. know, I'm still trying to pursue this. And by the way, my other job is selling comic books. That's such you a good, I mean? I'm so glad you brought that up. So take another block and we're going to get into this comic book stuff. Oh, that's not good. So I can see one that's written on, so I know I'm not, I know I'm not going to grab it. <laughs> 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 so I know you got the stores, the uh, Torpedo. We have two. We have two right two. now. We have yeah. two right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Vegas and OC for now. For, for now, okay. But I plan okay. on expanding. Okay. I heard when you're collecting your art and everything for these stores and just your collector, you only hang on to your art for like 10 years? And then... Not everything. Not everything. But in general, I feel like, uh, look, you don't own anything. Mm -hmm. You know, all of these pieces are going to outlive me. So I caretake them for the amount of time that I have them. I'm responsible for them. And I'm also responsible for the next generation getting it from me. So whenever it concerns art, I don't like to own anything for more than 10 years because at a certain point, it's one of, one of many on a wall you don't have that same feeling about it, you know? So I like to sell them, move the money into another piece that I enjoy for 10 years, five years, whatever it is. That's and cool. there's a couple of exceptions, stuff that, just, that gives me the same oh, feeling of I'm joy sure. yeah, yeah. from the first time to now. So those I keep. So I understand you're also uh, publishing and writing your own comic book right now. I am. Can you yeah. tell me a little bit about that? It's an original concept I've been working on for about four years. I got the general idea from watching Armageddon. Oh, I love that movie. Years ago. Yeah, right? fantastic. And, uh, and then a lot of life experiences that also inspired it, including where I came from in Lebanon, almost being killed, all that stuff. You know, We discovered that there's a meteor or asteroid coming towards the Earth. And it's about twice the size of the one that took out the Do you see what's dinosaurs. happening to you right now? I sure do. <laughs> I'm still listening. But I, like yeah, I know, but I'm, now I'm like concentrated <laughs> on this. Oops. The guy with the shakiest hands. <laughs> Bass players are shaky. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. You're saying that we only have to follow the, the solid drummers all the time? Listen, bro. <laughs> we all know drummers lead the band. All right? Let's not pretend. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not pretending, John. I'm not pretending. <laughs> <laughs> they lead the band to the worst situation. <laughs> all right. What the fuck am I going to do with this? 
You can take your mind off of it and tell me, so the, the meteorite's coming. Yeah, I think I'm gonna have to concentrate on one thing at a time. <laughs> I thought you were a drummer. I'm you got, you got all these. Too. You got all these things going on. Yeah, I'll just on. move this one to here. <laughs> oh, and you got one. What does it say? Name the six cast members from Friends. That's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I, I can try. I mean, yeah, they're real try. names? Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. The, the character names. Okay. Um, let's see. Joey. Joey. <laughs> Joey, can I already Rachel, put an X on this one? <laughs> Joey, Rachel. Uh, that might be it for me. Okay, you're going to have to take a shot from the hat. What? Yeah. What is that? It's tequila. That's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> I hate tequila. The only thing I could even, the only thing I could even slightly do is a 1940, what is it, 1941? 1942. Oh, 42, okay. Yeah. They, this is not that. Okay, I'm gonna pass on the hat to Keila. <laughs> with all due respect. All right, all right. It's How on about, me, by the way. Yeah, it's on me. How about you just pound that one and pour another one? All right, so anyway. The meteorite's coming. Yeah, meteorite's coming. The government tries to suppress the information. Eventually it gets out. The worst things that you can imagine happen, rape, murder, mass suicides. After some months, people are just like, wait a minute, you know, we're all gonna die. You know, we're human beings. Let's live like human beings. So it's the first time in history that there's complete real peace on earth, no religious persecution. Um, everybody's just basically living their lives and people even go back to work. They just live their normal lives, but like they, they cherish every second that they're alive, right? Dude, this is awesome. Please yeah. proceed. So about two weeks out, when we know that this imminent destruction of the earth is gonna take place, for whatever reason, the asteroid explodes and it basically turns into dust, right? And what's left is this basketball shaped orb and it's almost like a liquid metal. That hits the earth, creates a 20 mile crater and people are just like, we're gonna live. We're gonna live, right? So now like there's mass rejoicing. This orb is the epicenter of the crater. So we sent out like scientists, everybody's investigating because first of all, that asteroid appeared out of nowhere because we're constantly mapping out the cosmos. Wasn't there, you know, a day before, but then all of a sudden it was there. So where'd it come from? Okay. What is it? It's even more fearful now. Like the people are more fearful now. Like, what is this thing? So we send all our best scientists and they're kind of, uh, they're investigating it and, and probing it and doing all these things. And I want you to picture like a line of helicopters, you know, the double bladed military ones. Oh yeah like a line of them, 10 of them or so, and they're, and they're carrying supplies in from the outer rim of the crater into the epicenter where they've set up some tents and research equipment and whatnot. And then one of the cable snaps on the load, and as you know, like a pendulum that goes this way, and then it basically mm -hmm. the helicopter crashes, explodes, and there's a, an employee on the floor of the crater and he's working and the concussion from the explosion sends him like 20 yards, right, up in the air. and he, he lands on this crater floor, which is a rock floor, and he gets lacerated, he's got a broken arm, and he's just trying to kind of steady himself. He doesn't even know what happened. He puts his hand up, turns into an infant. Turns into uh, a fucking infant? Infant. But, with the exception of some speech difficulties, is the same person that he was right so before that second. Fucking, he's, a, he's the man trapped in the, in the infant's body. body. So what we discover is, and where the story takes place 150 years later in the most expensive city in history, is that for whatever reason, there's properties in this orb that make you younger. And it's Fountain proximity based. Yes, finally youth. So if you're within like five feet of this thing, you'll decrease in age like uh, from 40 to 10 years old within one hour. And then if you're a little bit further away, the effect it's like is less. the lessened. best day spa for like I've ever correct, heard. Correct, correct. And all the way to like a, a certain point about halfway, the crater, the crater halfway, where you don't age at all. Like that's a sweet spot. And then it goes decreasing. You decrease, you know, you don't age as quickly. But, up you're, until, still, but you're still decreasing in age. Gotcha. No, you don't decrease, you don't age as quickly. Okay. So you, it, the sl it's a slower process of aging. Gotcha. So like one year will take you four, then five, then six, then seven, so on and so forth. And it is only effective until the edge of the crater. And then what they, they do some research and they figure out that there's a dome, like an onion, right? That surrounds this orb 
and the crater, and that's the effective area, right? That's it. So it doesn't go underground. Okay. And for whatever reason, what one we don't know yet, it only is effective in this area. So now it's 150 years later. There's been a cataclysmic event, either a war or something else. I'm not going to tell you now. Okay. You'll have to read the book. Yeah. But, Everyone um, read this book because I... about about 15 billion people have been killed, and there's about 900 million people left planet wide. There's approximately 30 million people living in this metropolis. And then um, there's a sister city that's been built around it, just people that want to be near this place. There's no effect on them, but they're near it, right? And they're only allowed to have three-story high structures because the city, Ascentia is what it's called, or Ascensia, depending on how you want to pronounce it, has dictated, look, you can live here, but you can't live above us. We want to be able to monitor you. We don't want you to have vantage points. And there's like a 150-foot wall around this entire city. Damn. Okay. And it's literally the most expensive real estate in the world. And the story essential, I mean, I could go on for like 17 hours just on the subject because of what's in my head. Yeah. But the essentials of the story are, what would you do if you were given the opportunity to live there? Who would you fuck over? Yeah, who would you pay? Who, who would, would you leave? You yeah, what would you do? Which loved ones would you turn your back on to live forever? Yeah, right? I mean, it's, got, it's definitely got a... It's got a societal feel to it yeah. of like how, a, how you get in. There's a lot of depth and storylines that I can't get into right now only oh, because obviously. you would need, you know, several hours. You would need like 10 more hours of Jenga, which I believe yeah. it's your turn. No, no, it's yours. Fuck. So anyway, that's the beginning of the, you know, introduction to the story. In fact, you're really not supposed to find any of that out until like the fifth issue. Yeah, I know, but like but honestly, it, it sounds it like, it is. you know, this is... It's next level shit. I'm listening to the story. I can picture everything. I could see so much of the uh, apocalyptic uh, storylines that would fall into, you know, each individual person. You, you could have such incredible strong characters in this, right? That and would you do. Be, like, would be, yeah, I would imagine you and would it, and on top of that. The idea yeah. is generally to have like six to nine issue story arcs that kind of intermingle. You know, so there'll be several going on at the same time. Oh, I got one. All this time. You Speaking had... third person for three minutes. So Johnny would like to ask you a question. <laughs> All right. What's the question? Johnny would like to know, uh huh. how was it like working with Johnny's lead singer, M. Shadows, on your solo project? That douche? Johnny would like to know. <laughs> he was, uh, first of all, he's a really nice guy. And uh, I met him. He's in... not sure about that. Well, maybe not. In <laughs> I met him in Vegas. No, Johnny knows. He's good. I'm <laughs> you should keep this up for the rest of the interview. It's hilarious. Boy, I'm so fucked here. Johnny's excited about that. I bet he is. <laughs> so Johnny still wants to know, you worked with M Shadows. Yes. It'd be um, nice if he picked up a check at lunch every now and then, but aside from that, he's a great guy. Yeah, you know, I, I, I can't speak for... Uh, Johnny can't speak for that. <laughs> you fucked up. <laughs> what was the whole separation of system? What was it that uh, came to a head there? Can you talk a little bit about that, or is that something that you don't really want to get into? I think that... Well, first of all, it doesn't bother me to talk about anything, because I'm proud of everything we've done. And even if we did, never did anything else, I would still be proud of it. But, As you should be. It's a fucking super influential band here for, thank you. for us. I think at the end of the day, ego gets in the way a lot. You know, we've been enormously successful with each other. Ego gets in the way a lot. It gets in the way of relationships. It gets in the way of business relationships. And um, sometimes you lose sight of why you started to do something together. You know, in, in any industry, but more so in music, I guess I, I would equate it most to sports and music, right? Anytime a sports team wins a championship, all of a sudden everybody is involved and everybody's the oh, reason yeah. why they won, right? You got a lot of new cheerleaders. If you become successful, especially in music, everywhere I went, people were like, you're the fucking reason, you know? And I knew I wasn't the reason. I knew that ultimately, I would played in a lot of bands before System and none of them could draw 10 people. You know, if anything, I played in front of my girlfriend and the bartender more times than I cared to remember. You know, and I was the same drummer. You know, yeah. I had the same mind for drumming and I would try to come up with things that were interesting and, and do the best I could to 
create beats that I thought worked best for the song and were different enough from everything else and took all my influences plus whatever I have in my heart into, um, into like a context for the song. But it wasn't until I got in system and melded my talents with the other guys in the band that we achieved success. Yeah, it's kind of the, it really is kind of the stars aligning in, in a lot of ways. Now granted, yeah, System yeah. was already drawing a good crowd. They were a good band with or without me. At the end of the day, the people that were supposed to be in the band were, yeah. right? But I'll give all credit to the original drummer of the band. He was an excellent drummer. But ultimately, I always looked at it like, fuck, without my singer, my bass player, and my guitar player, I, I'm nowhere, right? Yeah. I'm still playing uh, at, a, at a club in the San Fernando Valley in front of five people. I you think know? I'm worse off than that. I think, I, I think no one's watching me and I'm playing nowhere. Well, well, maybe, <laughs> but yeah. I, I feel like if you got the passion for it, you'll play for nobody. Exactly, totally. You know? Because ultimately you're playing for the only audience that matters, yourself. Totally. You that's, know, a great, it, that's a great call. Yeah, because no matter what was going to happen, I was always going to play. I wasn't playing for them. I no. still don't play for them. Yeah. I play for me. And that's why they can be into it. You know? It's um, a great outlook, man. Thank you. So, with that being said, I never took it seriously when people that had no idea how much trouble it is to put together songs and put them out there, put yourself out there for people to then judge and critique and do whatever, you know, mean-spirited thing jealous people do and people that are not in the know make assumptions of things and, and ultimately, you know, it is difficult to put yourself out there. For me, not being a songwriter, it's a little bit easier, right? Yeah, yeah. But I am creating those beats. What I'm trying to say is people get into their own heads sometimes and things, you, you got to let things go in life. You're gonna offend each other, you're gonna have problems. Every relationship has them, you know? So you gotta get past it and get out of your own fucking way ultimately and system just hasn't been able to do that. You know, we have some things that have gotten in the way of, of doing what we do best and ultimately Darren's written music and released it on his own, Serge has done it, Shavo's done it. I'm doing a cover album, right? And it's a lot of fun. I've worked with really cool people it's, but it was, speaking of a but it's not of those, system. Yeah, no. So speaking no. of a couple of those really cool people, uh, yes. one of our mutual friends here, uh, M Shadows. Uh, He's sang, a great guy, man. Sang on, on, on one of your songs. Yeah, and I think it's one of the best songs on it. And again, I'm not, I'm not trying to, to create something to compete with system. I'm just doing it because I enjoy playing music. I'm not a songwriter, but I can arrange the fuck out of songs. Mm. So... I arranged these songs in a way that I thought was interesting and I, and I listened to songs that I thought maybe there was a lack or it, what would I do if I'd played this song? What yeah. would I do if I was presented this song? But the, the point is, you know, I'm the best when I got Serge, Chavo, and Darren with me. And nothing I do in music will ever compare with that. And, and I'm aware of it, I'm appreciative of it. I've got, in my opinion, one of the best live bands in the world, you know, with all due respect to everybody else. Yeah. That's, you know, everybody else is everybody else. We're I system would, of I a would down. Absolutely. You know, that's how I look I at it. I would absolutely agree, man. Um, and, I, and I'm going to be honest with you. We played a couple of shows that I was not proud of recently because we didn't put in the practice and we had like a skeleton crew. They set up the equipment, they set up the lights, all the production, all this stuff has to be set up so that we can go up and do our jobs, which is to entertain you ultimately. And um, when these guys all have to work when we're not working, you know? So more <laughs> often than not, Avenge does it the right way. They'll go, they'll do an album cycle, they'll do 100 shows or whatever it is in that cycle, which means they can employ these people for a year to two years. System does it the complete opposite way and half-ass. We employ people for three to four weeks, <laughs> which means we get who's available as opposed to who we want to work with long-term. So everything he just said is 100% right, but fuck you, John. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we're going to get to five games, by the way. <laughs> I know. You, you threw out the five games. We, we could recap. Well, I thought it would be like game. five seconds. You know? I, I played Django with a kid last night. It was over in like two seconds. Uh, I might be somewhat fucked. Somewhat. Either that or I'm going to be this really point, fucked. At this point, I have to go for something that's not as loose. And that's where I got married. 
Maybe she went for I something know. that wasn't as loose. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure if I, if, if I figured it out yet. So do you have any memories from that last OzFest? The, yeah. the only tour that we actually did together. 2006, right? Yeah, I really enjoyed you guys on that tour, but I don't think any of us had an opportunity to really develop a friendship, prim primarily so. because it was such a bummer tour for us, you know? I like we didn't know if that was going to be the last time. It could have been our last tour ever. We yeah. didn't know, right? Like Serge just, oh, wow, you got a good one. Serge at that time was. Ah! <laughs> Fuck. All right, one down. <laughs> well played, though. I mean, wow. That was a long game. That was a long game. We may have to just leave it at the one. Uh -huh. Cheers. Cheers, man. All right, before Let's we talk do a it, little bit about Avenge, man. Cool. You know? Yeah, what do, you want, what do you want to know about? Tell me about where you guys met each other. Oh, dude. So I'm the youngest of the band. Um, my older brother was actually uh, good friends with uh, Jimmy and Brian back in like middle school. Mm -hmm. And they used to be over at the house with, you know, my bunch of fucking older kids. And I was the younger kid, wanted to hang out and I'd get my ass kicked just trying to hang out with them. And then, you know, years went by, blah, 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 blah. Um, Jimmy and Brian joined with Matt and Zach in Avenged Sevenfold. They're in a garage down the street from one of my friends I was, I was jamming with. And I used to knock on the door and be like, can What's I go going check on? Out? Yeah. What's going on? They had a bass player at the time. Everything was good for them. I was in high school. And uh, I was at another party months later with uh, uh, Val, uh, Matt's wife. I asked how the band was doing. They they had been touring for a little while, like local West Coast stuff. You know, uh, their own tours, or were they signed at this point? They weren't signed yet. Uh, if they were, oh, they were signed to a, a European band that I don't think I could talk about. Okay, it was a little a, label, small label. Yeah, small label. Um, they weren't signed. Uh, they weren't. They weren't really signed. Officially, from, from my understanding, I asked how things were going. They said that the bass player um, of the band was going away uh, for like two weeks at the end of this tour um, to be a part of a wedding. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And they're like, no, it sucks. We got two weeks. We're going to do a co-headlining tour with Atreyu up and down the coast. Uh, and they're looking for people. And I was like, well, I'll throw my hat in there. You know I, know, I know I'm a kid or whatever, but I could probably find a way to get school off for a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. and you had the passion. Just fill in. Yeah, obviously, I, I really... Loved all the dudes. And, were you always and, on base? I was I, predominantly on base. So not even predominantly, always on base. I started, though, on my uh, father's acoustic guitar. He had a nylon guitar. Mm -hmm. And I kind of picked that up and tried to play it. I started learning a couple songs on it. and Gave it, you a little confidence. Gave me a little confidence okay. to go like, hey, mom, dad, I, I really want a bass. Mm -hmm. So since then, I was, I was always a bass player. And uh, yeah. Put my uh, my hat in the card and whatever the card in the hat, the fuck it's called. Whatever it, you got in the band. <laughs> yeah. You went on the tour. Yeah, I went on the tour, and I was just I was just filling in at the time. Like I didn't, I wasn't expected to join. I was a fucking eighteen year old kid. Mm -hmm. They had already been touring for a couple of years, and uh, yeah, they said I fell out of the van one day, drunk as fuck. Said, "Do you want to join the band?" Because you vibe with them. Yeah. Right? So it's like yeah, the missing, way more about the the missing piece came into yeah, play. Yeah. See, but that age, you're still a sponge for it, right? Absolutely. Like you, don't that, have that, you don't have that ego saying, or if you do, it gets destroyed pretty quickly. Right. I had the ego that I thought I, was, I am the best player at Marina High School. <laughs> well, if you don't think you're the best, what the fuck's the point? Yeah, no, I know. I, you know I, I mean? definitely had that. Like at but... some point, if you don't think you're the best, what are you doing it for? True. You better be the best. You better be the best in your area. And when you take it up to the next level, you better make sure your band's the best. Yeah. You, if you don't go on that stage thinking you're better than everybody else up there, <laughs> you shouldn't be on that stage. That is Agreed? the best way of describing my ego that I've ever heard. No, because no, no, it's true. You go up there and you fucking, you own it, man. You yeah, gotta, you own you that got, stage. You got to do it. Come take it from me if you can. That's how I feel. Yeah. Like, except for those last two shows we played. Those were embarrassing <laughs> for me. That bothers me, man. You, may, you that, might have been. Listen, you might bro, have been. You might be hard on yourself, though. Don't don't get me wrong. Every band is their own entity, there's, and every one no of way, them. Everyone works a certain way. Every one of them own the stage at the particular time they're on there. But I truly believe 
that when System of a Down is firing on all cylinders, there isn't a band in the world that can best us. And I look at that as a challenge, because you got that kid out there that's watching you, right? Yeah. And they're watching you the way you watched the bands that you went to see. And if you're not fucking ripping it up, what are you doing there? You're going to disappoint that kid. There's, there's kids watching me drum. They're, looking, we're, they're waiting for me to make a mistake. Isn't that the craziest thing, though? Uh, it's a lot of pressure. It's who got you here. It's also being unique, bro. Yeah. Like, what you I like about unique. Avenged is nobody sounds like Avenged. What I like I about you guys is I see kind of the influences. Dude, I remember you are one of those influences. I remember when uh, Toxicity came out and it was played all over fucking K-Rock. Mm. And we're in the fucking Econo van driving all over the fucking place. Yeah, that makes me feel so good because it's, just, it's the same, man. And you guys elevated and your music's really good, you know, mm -hmm. and really unique. And there isn't an, another band that sounds like a band Sevenfold. So you can listen to Event Sevenfold from the first note and know it's Event Sevenfold. Okay, you listen to the Deftones. You know yeah. from that first snare hit, it's Abe. Yeah, you fucking you know hear it. it immediately. Immediately. You, anybody else sound like Chino? No. No. Nobody. Okay, so, okay, real quick though. Yeah. On the spot, favorite uh, Deftones record? Around the Fur for me. Really? Yeah, for me. I, I'm, I'm a white pony guy. Huh? I'm a white pony guy. I like white pony. It's, I just love the vibe that they created with White Pony. I, I love all the records, don't get me wrong, but White Pony, when that one, that one hit, uh, it, was, it was something cool for me. Well, I will tell you the coolest part of that, and you're not gonna see this coming, was when they played and that giant banner comes down and it's all red and you got that just white Mustang or whatever horse it is. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's fucking, Mustang. it was like, wow. You know, yeah. that hit, that hits you. It's little things like that that I look for, though, man. Yeah. You know, of course, Abe is a monster drummer. Love him. And I think the Deftones are one of the most talented bands. Um, what do you think of the new Tool album? Be honest. I absolutely love it. And I am being honest. Um, I'm a huge Tool fan. Um, for what it is, like, what are you striving for with some kind of single on a record these days? Well, then, no single on fucking Tool nope. albums. Nope. <laughs> That's for sure, especially this one. They're never, for a while, there really hasn't been, but this more solidified it to me. When I looked at it and listened to it, it's just a bunch of fucking music, which is perfect. What is every kid doing right now? They're going through playlists. They're going through an album. They're just well, they're, they're I don't calling, think they're they're calling Alexa to play something. I don't think they're going through albums. I think they're listening to songs here and there. Yeah. No, they're not you're listening right. to complete albums. The crafting of an album is lost. But then again... I don't, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily... I, I, well, I mean, it's not as popularized, right? It's, it's not as popularized. But if you go back to the 50s, man, that's how it was, right? Totally. It was singles. It was all singles. And then all, LPs All my came favorite out, dudes, right? I, I, I got... I got little fucking EPs like just, just ready of, of yeah. everything. But, but then, then again, it's also the fault of popular music because you made albums that sucked and there was only one or two songs worth listening to. <laughs> so you kind of pushed, not you. I'm saying a lot of popular music. He said music. me. <laughs> you know what, I'm speaking in the fourth person, okay? The what I mean person. to say is, when you, when you look back at before, um, before Napster came out, yeah. You'd buy an album, and I listen to pop music too, man. My, my, I have very, very taste. Like, Sia is one of my favorite artists of all time. Love her. You know? But um, you'd buy an album, and you listen to the album, and you'd be like, the fuck is this bullshit? There's only one good song on this. I paid $15. Yeah. You know, it was a ripoff. <laughs> and people were like, well, f you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool, fool you twice, shame on me, right? Yeah. So it's actually... You can, you can blame the artists who put out bullshit records, and you can blame the record companies that got very greedy, and they said, look, we're gonna fucking, we're gonna hose you and take every penny from you that we can. But if you still make an album that's worth listening to, people will buy it. People Absolutely. will listen to it, people will this find it, answer. and they'll gravitate to it. Love, I love your honesty with that, honest, with, with that answer, because you're absolutely right. Go back to the 50s, go back to any time, like there, there's still a lot of that going on. When a good record came out, a good record fucking People will came gravitate out. towards it. And they will yeah, listen to right. it and they will memorize it and they will live that record. You know? And let me tell you something. And it was er and it there's was a system of a down record written already that might be the best thing we've ever created. And it's coming out. Uh, and it's two never weeks. coming out. 
<laughs> Unfortunately, I don't think it's ever coming out. But I will let you listen to it. I would love to hear it. I would love to hear it and love to tease yeah. everybody that if they I, can If hear. I actually had a copy of it, I would love to let you listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll just about do it. Thanks to John for stopping by and kicking my ass and Johnny Jenga. Make sure to follow John Domine on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And check out drinkswithjohnny.com to find the archive of all our episodes. And check out the Avenged Sevenfold YouTube channel for video content. If you like what you're hearing, hit the subscribe button on this podcast, write us a review, leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Until next time, cheers.